Well, please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's Holy Word to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans, the eighth chapter. Our consideration this evening will be Romans 8, verse 6, but I will read beginning in verse 1. And as you turn there in your copy of God's Holy Word, as many of you know, this is our preparatory service, one of our two preparatory services, and we come this evening to examine our graces. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, as you're well aware, the Lord said, let a man examine himself before he comes to the Lord's Supper. And today our examination ought to be whether we are spiritually minded people, whether we are spiritually minded, and that will be what we will take up in the preaching. So Romans 8, beginning in verse 1. Let us hear now the words of the living God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And this is our verse especially. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. O Lord, we come now to the preaching of the word of God, and we pray for divine help for the minister now as he seeks to proclaim faithfully the excellencies of the knowledge of Christ. We pray that the minister would decrease so that Christ may increase, that our thoughts would not be filled this week with thoughts of mere men, but of the man, Jesus Christ. And so we pray that the Spirit would do this work by the preaching of the word. And we pray for the people of God now that they would leave this place rejoicing in Christ and rejoicing that every thought of theirs may be uh, enraptured with the beloved. O Lord God of heaven, to these ends we pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord my strength, and my Redeemer. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is the case that it is the spiritually minded man or woman that is fit to commune with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the spiritually minded man or woman that is fit to commune with the Lord Jesus Christ. How strange it is, brethren, that we would say next week, that we desire to commune with the Lord Jesus Christ and we have scarcely had a solitary thought of him all the way up to the Lord's table. What a strange thing it is to say, I wish to commune with the Lord, but I do not wish to think on him and to have spiritual thoughts of him. We rarely, brethren, this is the case, meditate on heaven where he is. I think all these sermons in the last weeks are building up to this theme here. Our affections are often so constrained upon the world. Our thoughts are way too often, even for believers, earthy and sensual. We're too busy, we say, with the things of this world to spend a solitary moment with him in the week. When there's a conflict between even lawful duties and time spent with the Lord, who gets the short end of the stick? But then we say, I want to come to the Lord's table and I want to commune with the Lord Jesus Christ. That really makes a mockery of these things, doesn't it? And that is to profane the supper. But to the one who is spiritually minded, even imperfectly so, yet their heart and mind is stayed upon the Lord day and night. They come to the Lord's table and they receive the blessings of this verse, verse 6. They receive a greater measure of both life and peace because their mind has been stayed on the Lord and they are prepared to come and meet with Christ. And so this week, we are to examine where our mind is as we prepare for the supper. 
that we would honor the king with our thoughts and our affections and then come to receive his blessings at the table, knowing that communion with the Lord day by day is what leads to deep communion with the Lord at the supper. And so this is our preparatory theme, an examination of our spiritual mindedness, an examination of our spiritual mindedness with the three headings tonight on your bulletin, the first of which is blessing, second, testing, and third, growing. First, blessing. And what I want to begin with is a consideration of the blessings that are found in the sixth verse, because we do not often consider them. But before we do that, let us consider the flow of the chapter and how we get to verse 6. In the first verse, Paul sets the glorious truth that there is now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, to which we have long said a hearty hallelujah in response. But note what is said of those who are not condemned. There in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation, but they also do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then, in the next verses, the Apostle says that due to the work of the Son of God, we are freed from the condemnation of the law, because Christ was condemned in the place of those who will believe. That we may walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's that walking again, verse 4. But then in verse 5, which sets up our verse 6, we read that they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So consider the, the points and the flow the Apostle sets forth and its necessary conclusion as we consider this doctrine of spiritual mindedness. You say the new birth, we say the new birth comes way of the Holy Spirit. He gives us faith. We are justified in God's eyes. We are saved. There is now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. But is that the end? I think for too many of us, that is the end of our religion. In a way, that's the beginning, isn't it? What are the consequences of being born again? Well, you are of the Spirit. The Spirit has caused you to be born again. It's not just, and put this away, a decision for Christ. As though you signed a card someplace and you say, well, I guess I'll I'll choose Christ. You walk away. No, the Holy Spirit, if you are truly his, has been given to you. You are born again. And being born again, you are to not mind or mind not the things of the flesh. You mind now the things of the spirit because you are born again of the spirit. Now, that is a simple and airtight series of logical consequences such that We cannot separate a saved person from a spiritually minded person. They're not, in other words, two classifications of Christian. The carnal Christian, you might hear this in the popular Christian church sometimes, and then there's the spiritual Christian, as though they're super Christians, and then there's your ordinary carnal Christian. There's only one sort of Christian, the spiritually minded Christian. Now, what does the apostle mean by mind in this text, like in verse 5? Well, in it, uh, it, this word, it means to set one's mind on an object. Uh, The mind here being representative even of the soul of man, the seat of our will, affections, thoughts, and reasonings. And in our text, there is a great division, as you have noticed. There are those who will set their mind, their affections, their desires, their thoughts on carnal things, in contrast to the one who will set their mind on spiritual things. This is the divide. So where are we? How do we judge ourselves? Which category do we find ourselves in? And what this divide shows us is you cannot come to me and say, Pastor, I'm just not a spiritual Christian. I'm just a plain and ordinary Christian minding the world and its things. Maybe this text is then for ministers and elders, Pastor, but I am not particularly spiritual And I am not, I don't believe, called to be so. You say, I'm thankful, yes, to Jesus for saving me, but I really have no time for spiritual things. No. If you are a Christian friend, you must be spiritually minded. There is no exception here. It's a consequence of the new birth. And consider the warning on the other side of the ledger. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. 
That ought to give us pause. Not just for the Lord's Supper, but generally so. That if I am carnally minded, that is death. Brethren, if we are carnally minded, we are dead. If your thoughts and affections are always set upon the world and the things of the world, if your thoughts and affections are set upon sin and lust and not righteousness, if your thoughts and affections are scarcely or never really on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is death. That is carnally mindedness. You are dead spiritually. And really, you can say, that's not my word, right? That's the Lord. That's saith the Lord. That is the warning. And I want to put that before you, before you consider the blessing. There are tremendous blessings, though, which the Lord uses to allure you to a spiritually minded walk. And this is what is often quite overlooked. But these blessings are also meant to further draw our affections to heaven. The blessings are found in this. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Two blessings to be greatly desired by God's people, life and peace. If being carnally minded is death, meaning it's corpse-like and dreadful in its effects upon the soul, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Think on that. There is a transformative effect for those of you who are spiritually minded. Uh, the more spiritually minded you are, not only is your soul, first of all, your soul was born again, right? When the Spirit came uh, and effectually called you, your spirit soul is alive because it has been born again. But as you are spiritually minded, more life-giving vitality comes into it. It becomes more and more alive. It becomes more vibrant and more filled with the fruit of the Spirit. It becomes, you think on these effects, less hypocritical. It becomes more godly. It becomes more firm in conviction. It loves more. It repents swiftly. It rejoices in God only. It endures afflictions well. Its communion and communication with God himself becomes more vibrant. There's more life. You have become more alive to the presence of God and you find yourself more and more dead to sin and alive to righteousness. The more that you set your mind on heavenly things. But also flowing from this greater spiritual life, there is the great blessing of peace. Oh, how the soul that is spiritually minded finds itself in great peace. You know, if your soul is in turmoil, child of God, and it is tossed to and fro all the time, full of anxieties and cares, especially the cares of this world, I think it's a simple diagnostic, isn't it? I am likely not spiritually minded. You need to ask yourself, are you spiritually minded if you're not finding peace in your soul? But if your thoughts are of the God of heaven, they are high and lofty thoughts of him, what do you find? You find the peace that passeth all understanding. And the Lord has expressed this to you. I know this is probably a memory verse for many of you. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose what? Mind is stayed on thee. Do you see the spiritual mindedness? There is peace that flows from God the more that you set your mind on him. And so the blessing of being spiritually minded is finding the joy of eternal life come and intrude into this life. Of the heavenly life which is where your affections are, ought to be if you're spiritually minded, flow into the life that is now. And you have the assurance as well. This is where peace flows. Assurance of eternal life and peace is yours the more you're minded on God. Because as you think on God more and more, you think on his word, you think of all that God is to you in Christ. Of course, life and vitality comes to your soul and the peace of God comes as well. Now, to aid in our examination. Uh, you might have a marginal note in your Bible which says that the Greek uh, for spiritually minded can be translated as the minding of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit, which kind of gets to the point, I think, exegetically. The things of the Spirit are the substance of the Christian soul. The Holy Spirit that dwells in us, he then draws our affections to Christ and heaven. He delights in the word of God which he has inspired himself uh, you delight in the things of the Spirit, you know, the Word, all the ordinances of God, including prayer. 
And you know, in prayer, the spirit is a participant, isn't he? Right? And you delight in the people of God in whom the spirit indwells. Those who are spiritually minded then mind the things that the Holy Spirit delights in. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart in Psalm 37. Well, with that set before you, where you see the blessing, uh, even true believers, and I do not wish to press on you too far, you need to understand that true believers are a mixture of being carnally minded and spiritually minded. What you need to see are the dread effects of the soul on the soul believer uh, if you are carnally minded, that is death. And you need to see the great blessings of the soul that is spiritually minded, which is life and peace, that you would draw your affections heavenward and put to death the minding the things of the flesh, that you might receive the blessings of the promise of the word of God, particularly at the communion table in a week. And so having considered briefly the blessings that come to the spiritually minded man or woman, let us consider some ways to test ourselves in our second heading. Well, let's begin with the basic truth. Uh, If spiritually mindedness is life, it is, not to be trite, a way of life. It really does define your life. And so your life must be examined. You cannot compartmentalize, and this is a great danger in young people, you especially, you cannot compartmentalize your life. You cannot say I'm spiritually minded on the few hours I'm in the congregation on the Lord's Day. And then in my business dealings, I will be carnally minded. At home, I will be carnally minded. In the workplace, I will be carnally minded and not spiritual. If you compartmentalize your life, that is the product of a carnal and not spiritual mind. Now, as we are speaking of being spiritually minded, Our examination begins then by examining the whole of our thoughts, all of our thoughts, and whether they are uh, directed towards spiritual things. And uh, are you willing this week, children of God, to put yourself under the examination of Psalm 139, 23? Search me, O God, in my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This is what we must do during the week. We are to ask God to shine a light into our heart and our thoughts. And we have to say that God is meant to have the first place in your thoughts and mine too. Think of how the wicked are described in Psalm 10 verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. God is not in all his thoughts saying that the wicked man doesn't have God in all his thoughts. There's a kind of hypocrite who occasionally has a thought of God when it is convenient for him. But the believer is meant to have their whole life filled with thoughts of God. Our calling as those who walk in the Spirit is to have God in all our thoughts. And so the believer ought to constantly be thinking upon the Lord as they walk in this life. When on their bed, they think on God. When in the shower, they think on God. When they eat, They think on God. When they have joy, they think on God. When they have griefs, they think on God. Whatever duties are before them, they think on God. Whatever the opportunity they have, whatever stage of life they're in, they think of God. God is in his all his thoughts. What does the apostle say? He says, take every thought captive for Christ. And I think our problem is saying, well, that means we have to go and uh, um, be apologists towards the unbeliever so that they would take every thought captive for Christ. No, it begins with us. We must take every thought captive for Christ. He's worthy of it. Consider how our psalm book begins with the blessed man's thoughts. Psalm 1-2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate how often? Occasionally, day and night. Day and night. This is the blessing of the spiritually minded man. He delights in the word and meditates and thinks on it day and night. In Jeremiah 4.14, God asked his people, and maybe we need to hear it. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? How long are we going to have vain thoughts? How long is it going to be until we have high and lofty thoughts of God in every circumstance? What is, I can't answer the question, what is the frequency of your thoughts on God in comparison to your thoughts on the world? 
and the things of the world. Your lusts. How often are your thoughts on worldly amusements and pleasures and the things of the world? It's movies, it's games, it's amusements. How often are your thoughts even on lawful things like your property and work and family? But divorced from the Lord and a consideration of Him, even lawful things, even good things, can be the product of a carnal mind. I remember being raised as a Hindu. And my parents had a wonderful thought about advancing themselves materially, working honestly, working hard. They had built a nice home for themselves. They were very respectful towards us. They wanted us educated. But yet, the product of a carnal mind that did not know God. And so because we do good things, perhaps, it does not mean that we are spiritually minded. There is no thought of the living God in any of their thoughts. Many of you are very busy. This is one of the issues with our society. You may be tending to home and hearth and field and employer. You fret here and there and everywhere on, on such things. But your mind is often not actually stayed upon the Lord. And whenever the opportunity comes to spend time with the Lord versus your lawful calling, extra for your lawful calling, or for home improvement, or yet another hobby for the children, or something else, again, who gets the short end of the stick? God does, which is frankly outrageous. And then we wonder, why am I sapped of life-giving vitality, and why am I sapped of peace of mind? Well, these things are plain to see in the scripture. Consider what Jesus told Martha. Thou art careful or full of cares and troubled about a great many things. But she was not truly mindful of her Lord, was she? Even though she thought she was. She didn't choose the better portion, a spiritually minded frame and conversation with the Lord. Now, if you struggle with cares of this world, consider how the Lord puts your thoughts in Matthew 6. 31, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? What does he mean by that? He means that your thoughts ought to be dominated by spiritual matters, not cares for the things of this world, even for necessary things of the body, wherewithal shall we be clothed? These things, even these cares and concerns for things that we need, which the Lord has said elsewhere, having food and raiment, therewith we shall be content, even our needs of these things should never push away our thoughts of the heavenly. So you need to test your love of present things this week to heavenly things that endure. Do I say, oh, how I love God, how I love thy law, Is that at the forefront more than I say, oh, how I love my car, how I love my job, how I love my house, how I love my family? If you prioritize the thinking, and then when you bring the thinking of God even into the family and into the home, then you find life and peace and a lack of care over the things of this world. One minister long ago said something to this effect, and I don't remember who, uh, I could probably guess, but it still captured my heart. He said, if you were meant to live for this world, God would have given you a longer life. If you were meant to live for this world, God would have given you much, many more days on this earth. But this world is not your home. And we are to meant to have high and lofty thoughts of heaven and God. Our affections are to be stayed on Christ. That's why he says, love not the world and the things of the world. We are meant to be weaned off of the world. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the way that our careers go is, of course, early on in our life, we actually have less. And then we start to accumulate more and more as our earnings go up. And sometimes the irony of that, the sad thing is, as we gain more and more in this world, we lose more and more of Christ. As we find ourselves more and more busy about the things of the world and less on the things of God, whereas we had many more opportunities when we had less of the stuff of this world to mind the things of God. Young people don't fall into that trap. Work hard, 
bless the Lord, bless neighbor, labor for the kingdom's sake, uh, earn in order to provide for your family and give to the cause of God, but never, never accumulate so much that you crowd out Christ. You're meant to be weaned off of this world. Now, some of us have a view of being spiritually minded that is actually rather shallow. Um, You will have spiritual thoughts when you are confronted with spiritual matters. And that's not spiritual mindedness. For instance, I'm preaching now. And you might start thinking of God now when I preach the word to you. Or when the Bible is opened and somebody's reading it, or you go to your even private devotion. Maybe you're doing this well. You go to your private devotional time, and then you start to think about Christ. I'm sorry to say that's not spiritual mindedness. Spiritual minded people have thoughts of God arise from their soul, not pressed upon their soul. They arise from their soul rather than being imposed by outside sources. Uh, The spiritually minded person has a heart that is an inner factory of spiritual thoughts. Consider Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Here are people who sit under the word of God. They will not do it. Why? Because their heart is stayed not on the word of God. They'll hear the word of God. Their heart is not stayed on it. It is stayed where? Covetousness. What is that? Loving the world and the lusts thereof. Even if their mouth says, Minister, what a wonderful sermon that was, or what a glorious text we have heard, where is their heart stayed? Covetousness. Which is why after the sermon and the service is over, there's scarcely a thought of God afterward. To them, preaching is something like performance art. But if you flip the text in Ezekiel around, you find two traits of the spiritual mind. One, they have a heart set upon the things of the Lord, and second, they do it. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. This is who you are. You know, in biblical anthropology, the heart and the mind are joined together in the soul, not to be divorced. And so we see that our heart's affections are to be on God and the mind's meditations are to be on God as well. Otherwise, you are a double-minded and unstable person. So we are to train our affections and our mind to be on the Lord. And if you are spiritually minded, one of the things that you will see is there are fruits of it in your life. And so for today, I have not a comprehensive view of the scripture, but to give you a taste and a place to begin, to give you seven main areas of examination of your life, Uh, to consider this week, that where you find defects and deficiencies, you may bring them to the Lord as you prepare to the supper, that he would heal you and that he would cause you to be more spiritually minded. First examination, and I didn't originally decide to begin here, but I think it is such a convicting examination, I will begin here. And let us begin then first with prayer. The spiritually minded person delights in prayer. It's not just to the, a duty to them, but it is a desire and it is a delight. And to them, the blessings of our verse are manifest when they pray, being spiritually minded, both life and peace flow out of their times of prayer. Beloved, have you never had a sweet season of prayer where you come in lifeless? You enter with your soul racked and wrecked with your troubles You plead with the Lord and you hand over to him the troubles of your heart. And what happens when you arise from your knees? You find life. The spirit has revived your soul and has given you great peace. That's the promise of Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And the spiritually minded man knows this. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the what of God. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's hard to call any of us spiritually minded if we scarcely pray. But also the content of prayer is very revealing, whether we are truly spiritually minded. You know that carnal men, men who are dead, and even non-Christians are sometimes quite constant in prayer. 
But what are their prayers full of? Earthly things. They pray for work. They pray for property. They pray for money. They pray for help in earthly challenges. I have a test, boys and girls, so I'll pray for that. They pray for bodily healing. Help me because I feel ill. Well, there's no qualms in praying for earthly needs. No, that's not the point. But if that dominates your prayers, you're not being spiritually minded. The spiritually minded man or woman remembers that there are three petitions that begin the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And their prayers, if they're spiritually minded, are full of these petitions. Because these are the things that the spiritually minded person longs for. They pray for the name of the Lord to be magnified upon the earth. When did you last pray for that? That God's name would be magnified on the earth. That is a spiritually minded person that the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. They pray for the advancement of the church of Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come. That's where their mind is. That's where their heart is. I long to see, as we even read providentially in Daniel's vision, of the kingdom expanding and smashing all other kingdoms of the earth. They pray for growth and grace for themselves and for others. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And they are spiritually minded, so they pray, Lord, give me what thou hast commanded and command what thou wilt. Where are these prayers, beloved? Where are they? Such are spiritually minded men and women. They desire the things of God. They desire the work of God. And so they pray for the things of God according to the will of God. And that leads to a second examination, which is that the spiritually minded person desires holiness and they war against sin. For the spirit, as you well know, children, is contrary to the flesh and is, um, and is contrary to it. Galatians 5.17. They know sin is anti-God against the Almighty that they adore. And so the spiritually minded person is constantly testing their heart for corruption God told them in Genesis 4.17 that sin desires to rule over them. God has told them sin is wicked. It is evil. It is an abomination to God. They're also mindful that without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And so they desire a holy living and a greater communion with the Lord. Because they know the word that says that their sin has separated them from God. Isaiah 59, verse 2. And they don't want that. They're spiritually minded. They want what? Near and dear communion with God. That's what the spiritually minded person wants. They want God, as we considered last Lord's Day. God is their great desire. And whatever it is that comes between them and God, they want put away. They want to walk with God. And so the spiritually minded heed the word of the Lord that says to them, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And when temptations come, they're spiritually minded, so they know the word of the Lord that says that God has made a way of escape for them. They're minded on the spiritual things in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and they seek out the way of escape, because their mind is spiritual. And as Joseph asked, in view of sin's temptations, the spiritually minded person says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Because God is in his thoughts all the time. They know God. They flee temptation. And that leads to the third examination. The spiritually minded man or woman meditates often on Christ his perfections, and his word. They think much on Christ. This is, you know, we think about how we just came here to this this examination. We came from Joseph, who knew his God. And that's what made sin abhorrent to the spiritually minded man. He said, I know my God. How can I do? What is lust? What is sin? What is any of it compared to him? And he flees. And so the spiritually minded man or woman meditates on God, on Christ, 
They say with Psalm 104, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. How often do you meditate on your Lord? How often are your meditations on him sweet? You know, in many ways, this is the best and most joyful way to find spiritual mindedness, beloved. If you're a believer, as we heard this morning, to you who believe Christ is precious, you admit with the bride in Song of Songs, chapter 5, that he is altogether lovely. And the more you discover his perfections in the word of God, the more that you see his beauty, the more you hate sin, the more that you say, what is this world compared to my beloved? When others ask, what is your beloved more than another? You go from the heart and you say, my tongue is like the ready uh, pen of a writer. Let me explain to you the many perfections of the Lord Jesus Christ. His goodness, his mercy, his compassions that fail not. Uh, that he loved me and gave himself for me. And so I live my life in view of that, that he was crucified. And so he crucified this world on the cross to me. His pre- present session at God's right hand, where we have our brother in the flesh, in humanity, sitting on God's throne. What an amazing thought as the ruler for all things for the sake of his church working all things for good, and so on and so forth. So the spiritually minded man or woman adores such a meditation and says what? It shall be sweet. Oh, are these not sweet things? Have they lost their savor to you, such that you can no longer say, I will be glad in the Lord? What can you possibly set your mind and affections on in this world? What have you set your mind and affections on in this world that can compare to that? leads to a meditation on the word of God, as we've already seen. It is to be our meditation, as in Psalm 1, day and night, night and day. (coughs) For in the word, we meditate on the Lord himself. That's where we know Christ. And we also find our duty to him. And it forms our delight, as in Psalm 119. This is the spiritual man who says, how I love thy law. Not reluctant that we have duties to the Lord, but remembering that the commandments are spiritual, as in Romans 7. And if we are spiritually minded, we understand that these commandments are defined by love. They are to be our desire. This is what the Lord Jesus taught us. And if the word has this primacy, we will never leave it unaffected. Right? Our, our mind will be stayed on the word of God. We will hide it in our hearts. We will draw out of it. When we have a spare moment, are we thinking, well, let me see what I can find on social media right now. Even if I didn't have my Bible with me, I would dive into the word of God that's in my heart and let me, let me have a sweet meditation on it. And this is what the child of God does. You remember the parable of the soils. And we have to ask ourselves whether the word is rooting into our hearts. Those of us who are spiritually minded will find life-giving vitality from the word of God. And we heard in Ezekiel 33, but you also hear from James, that we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers of it. Even if the word is not before our eyes, physically, When we come, if we are spiritually minded, we come to that crossroads of temptation or we come to a duty and we need wisdom. Well, wisdom's ways will be brought out of our heart if we know the word of God and we meditate on it. And out of the heart, we come to our fourth examination, which is our tongues. Because the spiritually minded man or woman adores Christ, their tongue is not full of vain or profane thoughts. But instead, their tongue is, I've already cited Psalm 45, verse 1, but I'll cite it again. It is so lovely. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Out of a meditation of Christ, right, our tongue would speak. If we're spiritually minded, what we ought to see coming out of our mouth are high and lofty thoughts of God. God's wisdom, God's glory, God's adoration. 
And we would speak of him much as in Malachi 3.16. We talked about this a few weeks ago in our Doctrine of Spiritual Conference. So I'll leave it there for you to reflect on even what the Lord has done in your own heart in those several weeks since that sermon was preached. Has there been a change in your tongue, in your conversation, in your conduct? If not, we need to continue to work by God's help on being spiritually minded. Examination five, uh, which is our delight in the Sabbath day and holy worship. Isaiah 58, 13 shows that the spiritually minded man calls the Sabbath what? A delight. A delight. And you think about this. It's the carnally minded man who cannot see it in his heart to set one day as holy unto the Lord. Why? Why do they say that? You know, you think about Christians who want to argue against keeping a day holy to the Lord, as the fourth commandment says. Well, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to go and do this. And what are those things? Are they earthy and sensual, or are they heavenly? You be the judge of your own self. But we love the Sabbath because it is a foretaste of the heavenly life. We get to spend, think on this, we get to spend time with Jesus. A spiritually minded man goes that direction. Instead of saying, I guess I can't go to get my coffee from Starbucks, I guess, oh, what a terrible thing it is, I can't go out to the restaurant or I can't watch the latest Avengers movie on the Lord's Day. They say, I get to spend time with Jesus. Who's carnally minded and who's spiritually minded, friends? To sit under his word, I delight in that. To pray to him earnestly, I say I'm too busy the rest of the week to pray for hours. Here I have time. I have no time the rest of the week to commune with the Lord and serve his people. And instead of spending their time on the Lord's day with more carnal things, they delight to say rest. I get to rest in the Lord. And I am weaned off of the things of this world because all these things are going to perish anyhow. And so my thoughts are in heaven where I will be. That also means that the spiritually minded man or woman delights to be present in the house of God above all other places on the earth. And again, not as a duty. It's a terrible thing, and I've considered this with our session. When we have to go to a a brother or sister and say you are breaking your membership vows when you are not regular in the worship of God, that's heartbreaking, not because, first of all, you're not here and that you're breaking your vows that you made to God Almighty. That is a terrible thing, yes. But what we mourn in is the fact that you don't delight in and desire to be in worship. That's where our heart breaks, brethren that you have no desire to be with God. Compared to our call to worship, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for whom? The living God. You know, if that was you, I know what your Saturday would look like. It would be a preparation for the Lord's day. I know what time you would get here to church well in advance of the call to worship. Because what is the spiritually minded person? My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. The spiritually minded person doesn't need their elders or the congregation. And I, I, I am so grateful for you. You often spur each other on in love and to good works and, and exhort one another to be in the house of God, but the spiritually minded person doesn't need their arm twisted. The same goes for your private devotions. Because you are spiritually minded, you think of this, the consequence. You want to be in the secret place, don't you? You think on the Lord and you say, I want to be with my Lord Jesus Christ, to hear a word from the Lord out of his Bible and to send up my supplications to him that before I have to go into the thorns and the thistles of this curse-filled world, I will spend time with the God of heaven because I depend on him, such as a spiritually-minded person. Examination number five. You can examine how you handle providences. The spiritually-minded person handles providences like Job in every case. The Lord hath given and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
The spiritually minded person, he or she walks by faith and not by sight. Whatever happens, this is uh, launching off of this morning. They say, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Because they are spiritually minded and they know their God. They've already meditated on him. And they say, uh, whatever happens, this whole world, the mountains may quake and crumble before me. The ground under me may be thrown about. But I will be still and know that he is God. God is sovereign, come what may. And what happens? Right? You think on this, and this is one of those areas where we need life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And you handle the travails of this world. In our sixth examination, we consider what appeal the world has for us. Ask yourself, and truly so, how much of a grip, be honest, how much of a grip this world has on you. Love not the world, here's the test, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is where? Not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John chapter 2. Why is your mind so often set on things that will not endure? Isn't that sort of the folly of 1 John 2 in its negative sense? which is that you are putting your mind on things that will pass away. Christ says, remember Lot's wife. And you need to ask, how much of a hold does this world have? What is it that I find my thoughts dominated by that are things in this world? Again, they could be lawful things, very lawful things. I've often found, you know, on, on Saturdays, I'm spending often much time with the Lord as I prepare for the Lord's day. And sometimes there are very many worldly thoughts that will rush into my heart and my mind. And I have to ask, why are these here? Why do these things have such a hold on me? That even as I prepare to minister, I'm finding my heart tugged in these directions. Ask yourself, can I lose all that I have in this world with joy? Or would you say, call me Mara, call me bitter towards the Lord? Am I laboring foremost for what will be consumed in the great consummation? Or am I thinking on and rejoicing in treasure laid up in heaven? Think of what your heart covets. Ask the simple question. Will it be in heaven with me? If not, detach yourself from it affection-wise. It will only lead to disappointment. And what you do have from the Lord Bless the Lord for and use them like in the parable of the talents for the service of the Lord. Employ them for Christ. The spiritually minded person looks at their estate and says, how can this be used for the glory of God? It's not mine anyway. The Lord has given these things to me to be a steward and it is required of stewards that they be faithful. And that's the, the mind of the spiritually minded. And our final examination is closely intertwined. And it has to do with how the spiritually minded find themselves redeeming the time. Ephesians 5, 15 through 19 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The spiritually minded person redeems the time, all the time that they can for the glory of God. Because they are filled with the spirit and they are spiritually minded. And you think even in those verses, which we as psalm singers often adore, you see how much is there of being filled with the spirit and employing ourselves towards the ordinances of God and to be mindful. The spiritually mindful are mindful of time, that time slips away very quickly from us. Time is to be redeemed, and they know that. 
and time that could be used for the glory of God and the enjoyment of him is instead wasted away so often. Children, now, some people will call me a legalist for this. I don't think so. I think this is wisdom. I have to say to you, put away games, especially video games, early on in your life. Don't be ensnared with social media if you have especially no self-control to use it for a redeeming purpose. There are many amusements that will make your mind set upon carnal things. And to be carnally minded is death. And you will find, and I know if you are a Christian and you have spent your five hours at the video game or your five hours binging Netflix or something, do you have vitality afterwards? No, you don't. You find yourself more tired than when you began. You need to redeem the time by setting your mind on the things of God. Be mindful, God has given you better things to do than scroll endlessly and smash buttons. Are you especially thinking on how you're redeeming your time and your talents for his service to serve Christ and your neighbor? Do we think on doing good works? When we're bored, here's a way to serve your neighbor. Pray for them. The spiritually minded person knows they don't even have to go and deliver some food to their neighbor. They can pray for them. This is the mind that is spiritual. So here are seven areas of testing for you this week to examine yourself. And for each of these areas, I've given you some scripture. I'm not making this stuff up, right? This is the stuff that the scripture lays out. And I'm mindful that all of us must grow in this. Right? None of us are perfect in these things. And that ought to encourage us to pursue a spiritual mind all the more. We must, what we must not do after we examine ourselves is sit in the mire and muck and mourn that we are not spiritually minded to the point where we don't go to Christ with these things. We mourn, yes, but not as those without hope. And we recognize that the Spirit can make us what we ought to be. And that's our final heading. And uh, time has gone away, so I'm going to be brief here. First things first. You cannot grow in spiritual mindedness if you are dead. You have to be born again. If you don't have saving faith, you cannot grow in spiritual mindedness. The worst thing to hear is somebody say, and this is what our culture says, right? I'm not religious. I'm a spiritual person. What they mean by that is that I don't love Christ. I hate Christ. and I don't want to be a Christian. You cannot be a spirit. If you've been thinking that spiritual mindedness has something to do with that nonsense, it doesn't. To be spiritual minded is to be born again by the spirit. You can be born again if you take Christ. You are dead if you're not in Christ. You must be born again. Take Christ. He will make you spiritual. But as we begin in the Spirit, we grow in the Spirit as well. That means we depend on the Holy Spirit to grow in spiritual mindedness. You pray for it. Oh, pray for it this week, brethren. That I would have high and lofty thoughts of God. That my meditation on Him would be sweet I want an earnest desire, Lord, for the things of God. Let me just ask, how often do we pray this way? How often do you pray that way? Spiritually minded people will find themselves going to the Lord like this. Pray that the Lord would grant what he commands you in Colossians 3, 2. Set your affections on things above, not on the things on the earth. Pray your affections would be stayed on Christ. And then go meditate on him day and night. Have your mind stayed on the Lord. Because a contemplation of Christ, I want you to never forget this, is transformative. We've thought on this a little bit, but we scarcely realize it, that to meditate on Christ is to be transformed by Christ. What does 2 Corinthians 3.18 say? But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We behold the Lord, and by the Spirit of the Lord we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Behold the image of God in Jesus Christ. And this is 
really coming back to the blessing of being spiritually minded. It's not just a bare duty. It is a blessed duty that transforms us. You know, when you read the godliest men and women, uh, men especially of old, as we have their writings, they who are godly and spiritually minded, you find the richest and deepest contemplations of Jesus Christ. You read them, no matter which age, church fathers, reformers. It's their contemplations of God that give them a spiritual mind, uh, his perfection, his beauty. They pant for him. It's palpable in their writings and they long for him. You see it in their prayers. And all the things of this world diminish before them. Then to go along with our sermon from last week, and it was a joy to hear in our spiritual conference how uh, a meditation on heaven was transformative for some of you. Meditate on heaven, your eternal abode. This is where your affection ought to be. We just scratched the surface of the doctrine. You need to long for your eternal abode. What a strange thing it is that we set our affections and our mind on things that moth and rust will destroy and not on heaven. Associated with that, meditate on the word. Don't just memorize it. Don't just read it. Meditate on it. And banish worldly thoughts when they conflict with what the word of God teaches. You know, boys and girls, maybe less for you if you've grown up in the church, but for several of us who've come out of the world, our thoughts are still filled with worldly thoughts. And we need to, when they conflict with the word of God, no matter how good the world's thoughts are, we need to throw them out and replace them with the doctrine of the world, a word, not world. You know, I think about how many of us will sometimes even still use things like Freudian categories, worldly proverbs that we'll speak, need to be gone and replaced with the word of God. And here's the rub. All of this is going to require an investment of your time. I'm sorry to say, You know, your society, our society, I should say, uh, it loves the pill. It loves the quick fix. No, these things take an investment of our time and energy. And so you need to invest in time with the Lord. That's something I have noticed that Christians today are loath to do. In fact, Christians have adopted this terrible doctrine. Time is not to be invested with the Lord, but instead wasted in the world. Well, much more could be said. I think this gives you a place to begin in your examinations. If you need something more comprehensive this week, you may find in uh, John Owen, Volume 7, his wonderful work on um, spiritual mindedness there. Much more comprehensive than I have time for. Um, And let me say again, brethren, you and I both will find much to mourn over as we examine our heart this week. Mourn, but again, don't mourn as one without hope if you are in Christ. You will come to the supper next week. Why? Because you are perfect. Because you are perfectly spiritual minded. No. You come bringing your faults. You come bringing your defects to Christ. You mourn over these things. You say, Lord, I am not the man or the woman that I ought to be. But you, O Lord, can make me what I ought to be. And he will come and he will strengthen your weary soul. But you must discover and then bring the defects to him so that he may dispose of them and that he may heal you of every spot and sin. This is the glory of examining our heart, knowing we have one to give our heart to. Say, take, Lord, all of this miserable stuff that I have discovered this week in my heart and make me heavenly minded. If you but ask for it, he will do it. Why do you not receive? And I think this is so wonderful as you tie it to the doctrine of earthly mindedness versus heavenly mindedness. James 4.3 says that ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. What are you asking for in your prayers? Ask for this good thing and see if he will give it. Beg him to heal you as a bruised reed and at the supper he may well do it for you as you come to this great means of grace, and you will find the blessedness of it manifest in your life. If it is truly communion you come for next week, child of God, cultivate spiritual mindedness the rest of the days of your life.
that your communion at the table will be blessed. Amen. May he help us prepare to meet him and may our thoughts of him be sweet. Let us pray, arise if able. O oh Lord God of heaven, we pray for thy Holy Spirit to help us now. What better thing could our mind be set upon but Christ? And yet our mind is often set upon vanity. Forgive us, O Lord. We ask that thou wouldst forgive us knowing the psalm that we sang this morning, that thy mercy endureth forever. We know that thou is very kind to those who have a desire to be sanctified. And so, Father, would you pour your loving kindness upon us? We do long for the day in which we will be glorified and there will be no more thought of carnal things. But would you sustain us on our pilgrimage to heaven by giving this one thing that we lack, a mind that is set upon Christ? And would you do it that thou wouldst be glorified in our lives, but that we would also fulfill the other part of our chief end, which is to enjoy God forever. May the God of heaven be pleased to answer these prayers. We trust we have not asked amiss to fulfill our lusts, but instead have asked rightly. We ask these things then in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>